friends ladies and gentlemen welcome to ercp master class this is second of our master class and as i said this particular ercp master class is for the surgeon by the surgeon and we are going to have five modules during which we'll give you and share with you all the tips you need for doing an ERCP and once we finish this online module I hope we will meet sometime after the COVID pandemic and teach you and uh, all the tricks we learned in the last uh, class and this class and the subsequent classes ok. Let us go on today that is trying to tell all the final tips today regarding how to prepare a patient, what are the equipments we need and how to educate your team and how exactly what exactly you should do during the procedure. So, I have classified them into this four broad categories as you can see the patient preparation to start with we need to know for example, whether the patient is coming in for ERCP for a right indication because you should say this procedure you cannot take it lightly. So, there should be a definite benefit a therapeutic intention for you to do the ERCP, ERCP is no longer a diagnostic modality. If you need somebody to have a biliopancreatic problem needs to be addressed by diagnosis we have MRCP, US, CT contrast. So, better we confine ourselves to have a definite indication like a CBD stone with a jaundice or a gallstone pancreatitis with persisting stone in the bile duct or increasing jaundice or sepsis. These are the two common indications I normally do. But in addition, I am sure in some situations especially when you have a patient with a malignancy, biliopancreatic malignancy, they need a palliative drainage. Yes, it has a value putting either a SEM stent or a plastic stent or occasionally we do especially when there is a very high level of bilirubin in a patient with a operable cancer, we will be able to do a preoperative drainage. So, these are all the possibilities we could think of. But I should also tell you about this so called soft indication, especially when you are a beginner try not to do surgeries when the indication is not very strong like trying to make a diagnosis of sphincter body dysfunction and do not do it especially when the patient is having a coagulopathy. So, these are the things I would think that has to be done and as I said in the last class probably you may refer to the last class to see how I explained about the importance of the informed consent because informed consent is a very important document that has to be signed after giving the patient the following details namely why we do the procedure the indication now how we do the procedure step by step starting from the anesthesia what the patient is going to experience in OT and how what happens after the procedure if it succeeds what happens if it fails what is the alternative all those things you need to tell and of course there are risks involved with ERCP we discussed last class like a pancreatitis because of ERCP. So, you have to tell them all like what I have the mnemonic here WHO what, why, how and the outcome. So, once you have the content of disclosure very clear and also with the patient in front of you with the relatives asking ample questions and also give him a pamphlet in their own language to see, understand then consent that if it is given voluntarily that is a legal document for you then we can proceed. But of course, some pharmacotherapy here especially when a patient coming for ERCP preoperatively all the patients I need to check apart from the LFT two important things the INR especially when a patient with a jaundice if the INR is more than 1.4 or 1.5 I like to give them at least 3 doses of vitamin K 10 milligram IV and consider during and also after the procedure prophylactic antibiotics the third generation cephalosporin especially IV cephatoxin is a drug of choice for me. The second thing is coming to the anesthesia part even though I am sure large number of people they do under deep sedation the ERCP in my opinion I think it, the first few cases especially when you have a mentor and you are having your time better you do it under GA with anesthetist presence that takes a lot of stress on you. So, a short general anesthesia especially with a tube in place gives you a lot of comfort for you to go ahead and do the cannulation. The cannulation rate definitely is going to be better in the your beginning. Next important injection of course, is the contrast the same contrast what we use for the CT here it is even though it is 
can be excreted by the kidney better you ensure the patient creatinine is not too high and usually I, my recommendation is to go for 1 is to 1 dilution of the contrast so that minimize the amount of contrast and also my dictum is never fill the obstructed system unless you are able to go above it with a guide wire and into the catheter because no point in pushing under pressure the obstructed system then if it gets infected if it is not drained properly and definitely early then there is a chance of cholangitis and sepsis. So, be careful about injecting too much of contrast and too much of pressure especially in an obstructed system. Buscopan yes we do use buscopan some people do without giving the patient buscopan 20 milligram buscopan at the right time keep the duodenum immobile and ampullary cannulation is better. The last one we normally recommend especially when you have multiple probing prodding at the ampulla there is a theoretically you have increased risk of putting the patient into risk of post ERCP pancreatitis. I think this has been proved again and again by giving them a rectal diclofenac or indomethacin just immediately after the procedure minimizes the, the intensity or the chance of post ERCP pancreatitis. So, these are the few things I thought is worth sharing with you and I think we have discussed regarding the equipment to some extent last class. Let me just recollect because this summation of the five module is going to make you so knowledgeable and your cognitive skill is so good you will be itching to go for your technical aspects or technical training. And this is what we call the scope and how it look like inside as you can see this side being scope as you can see here in this picture nicely see you can see the side being camera along with the light and the encephalator. But what is most important is this particular elevator because the elevator the control of which you will soon find out in the video I am going to show you is going to be just close to your the big wheel. So, you have your uh, camera taken your uh, endoscopy the duodenoscopy in your left hand not dominant hand and uh, the big wheel whatever is next to the big wheel you have the up and down the elevator. So, that you need to control so that you are able to get into and able to see what we call the medial wall of the second part of duodenum is nicely seen thanks to the side being scope. And this is a close up view of a fusion scope as you can see the tip can be disposable because the chance of pseudomonas infection is so high. So, you should have a rigid disinfection protocol in order to clean this intricate parts with the appropriate brushes and a good disinfectant proper dwelling time all those things had be religiously kept. And this is a little picture to show you how an elevator is going to help you as you can see here. And as soon as I put my hand in the insert you can see and bring the thing down like this then it takes it up like this. So, you finger down on the elevator in the control head and the elevator lifts this thing and it drives this accessories into pancreatic duct or biliary tract depending upon the amount of the down you are making and also the angle at which you are going. So, elevator is so essential I think that is going to make a difference. So, if the elevator is not functioning or it breaks in the middle you may have to abandon the procedure unless you have a spare equipment. So, that is as simple as that and this is a mechanism elevator if it is something happens the mistakes or some damage it is a very expensive thing as you can see from here where from the elevator here you can see where it is attached how the wire is coming all the way here and right at the end here you can see and that how it helps. So, this intricate inside the design you need to understand then you know how difficult to repair they have to really dismantle the whole endoscopy or duodenoscopy in order to rectify the problem. And I told you already in the last class the importance as you can see here and the proper elevation proper angulation will bring you selective cannulation either the PD or a CBD. And this is the room layout just roughly to say that patient imagine the patient ideally in a supine or a prone or a left lateral whichever in a radial usant table and where the assistant nurse too it says here is actually my anesthetist normally stays there because I do it mostly under GA and endoscopy is myself my staff nurse on the right is my right hand she will have her trolley and you can see 
nicely placed ergonomically the both endoscopic monitor and x-ray monitor is next to each other so that I can have uh, look both this and uh, interpret at the same time you should see where it is coming from the other end here C arm is on this side it will come this side so it will not interfere and the diathermy will be somewhere here the machine will be kept so all those machines so you need a space here minimum 16 feet into 16 feet theater is what you require in order to have a very good comfortable working atmosphere and I also told you last class regarding the importance of the image intensifier how it works and the gear you need to put in order to protect yourself lead apron thyroid cover goggles all are important not only for you but all your staff should wear them and this three equipments out of which the energy source especially the one which can do what we call endo cut is very very important of course carbon dioxide insufflator is optional but it is essential when you are going to use spy glass and irrigation definitely it is of immense help especially when you have a problem with the bleeding and other issues ok now always you teach your staffs to keep them all nicely on a big trolley so that you know exactly what you need like here it is kept nicely as you can see I need a sphincter most of the time the cannula is no longer used especially we start with the sphincter tome wire guided sphincter tome hydrophilic tip this is what we use what type of wire we use thermo wire or lots of accessories are available I will discuss it later if it fails always you have a plan B for every step there is a step if it fails what is the thing so C knows if the staff nurse is experienced enough if I cannulate fail after two or three times she knows I am going to ask for a pre-cut so I need a pre-cut needle so that is also there here then you need a balloon and you need a stent and all those things and you have a contrast ready and saline ready everything is kept ready so that see you need not go in and out so everything you should anticipate what you need in this case and in some cases I will show you later if I think this patient may need even a CRE balloon I tell them beforehand so she keep that also ready with the alliance gun ok as I said out in the market there are plenty of accessories you slowly get all these accessories one after other as you can see here from one end to the other end I will start, start from here this is the very important piece that is a bow wire sphincter tome short nose here I am showing you but long nose and no nose there are a lot of things available and a needle knife these are the two important things I would think it is very very important of course you need a biopsy forces especially periampular lesion you have and you have a various types of hydrophilic guide wires biliary balloon fogarty balloon dormia six wire four wire dormia basket and this is spyglass that is not these are the two types of the stents you can see the pigtail stent is a very very important ok because they avoid unnecessary stent migration and the self expanding metal stents once you start experience that may be required especially in a case of a malignant stricture coming to the team as I said ERCP is a four letter word you have four key persons as enumerated here in this one and they are all standing here the endoscopist myself my anesthetist the ERCP staffs maybe one or two but definitely a radiographer ok and the layout of my OT is also is shown here as you can see here nicely how I am standing the anesthetist my staff nurse with all the accessories he knows exactly what is going to be expected from this one let us watch this teamwork how they work within themselves trying to perfect the art because ERCP is actually labor intensive highly demanding procedure it comes after a steep learning curve so you need to see at least 25 procedures before you start taking and at least you should keep on persevering for about 150 to 200 cases to have a cannulation rate which is accepted to be around 90 percent ok so here once we come what we call end facing you have to face to face the ampulla thanks to the shortening of the scope then you are able to cannulate selectively the bile and pancreatic duct I will tell you in the next subsequent thing our aim today is to reach up to the ampulla that is the module 2 module 3 I will tell you beyond the ampulla how to get into the bile selective cannulation if you are not able to do how to do a pre-cut and a pancreatic uh, cannulation all those things we will do in the next and the fourth one all the complications and uh, what are the challenges and solutions we will discuss and finally we will have something like a panel discussion so that is the way I plan the five 
short course module as you say here is how uh, uh, you can see spintrotomy is getting performed once it is done then the surgeon is pushing what we call a Fogarty balloon inflating it and dragging it as he drags it as you can see nicely the stone is dropping down into the duodenum. So, that is a thing very easily you can do especially when there is some suspicious lesions you can even take a biopsy. For example, if you have a patient with a stricture in or the cancer in the pancreas you have done a biopsy then you can go and put a stent also. So, here is a, a schematic representation of how you are going to railroad and exchange and leave a Amsterdam type of stent, pancreatic stent, biliary stent, various sizes, various diameters, there are plenty to learn about accessories, we will do that, but this is in essence what we are trying to achieve. Okay? And this is a glimpse of what a self expanding metal stent will look like, because they all will go through the channel in the ERCP scope. So, once you know how to deploy them if you especially when you have a good technician and it will be a, a treat to do and treat to uh, I mean see the patient getting well so soon. So, let me take you in the next 15 minutes or so with a couple of videos on the key steps to reach up to the ampulla. Okay? To do that I am having right here a patient whose as you can see is a prone that is the commonest position we normally see. Left lateral which normally we do for endoscopy is ok and supine nowadays I am using it increasingly especially when we do a single stage procedure like lap coli and followed by ERCP. So, this is a prone and supine both you are comfortable and whichever you can comfortable you can go carry on, but 90 percent of them will do in a prone position because the retention of the scope in the D2 is better and you are better oriented, but the only thing is you need to be very careful about the patient airway especially when the patient is not intubated. Okay. Let me tell you in micro, I told you the last class the importance of the steps broken into micro steps. How are you going to intubate the oropharynx especially with the side viewing scope? How are we going to navigate blindly in down into the esophagus to go into the 40 centimeter and not getting lost in the stomach reaching up to the pylorus how are we going to do and once we see the pylorus and how we are entering in the D1, D2 then dock and at the ampulla. So, all these things we are going to see in relevance to the duodenoscopy that is what we are I am sure. Let us watch one case then we will go here is what I am saying about the elevator as you can see I am testing the elevator going up and down because if it is not working there is no point in proceeding. So, that is control big wheel small wheel next to this big wheel is the elevator as you can nicely see demonstrated here and this scope what I am having here is fairly a big scope that is what we call a therapeutic ERCP scope which is having a diameter about 10.8 and a working diameter the channel diameter inside the where the all the accessories go is 4.2. So, very easily you can put a stent up to 10 French stent. So, this is what we normally use if it is a pediatric group or you want a smaller scope especially when you have a pyloric structure we have another scope which is having a 3.2 millimeter access channel. So, depending upon what you need you choose and then you proceed and you tell uh, the staffs and you see an idea where they are all st say I have two staff nurse uh, especially when we are using a complex procedure and we have a nicely laid out table as I just showed in the previous one and uh, see how I am comfortably holding this with a single hand while I am trying to I mean advise the anesthetist to give the injection and then here all the layout as we rightly said the sphincterotome balloon see what you see there you can see even a glimpse of the alliance gun and the patient is there as you can see and you just you can briefly see I am sure you will be and the my person here actually see he is actually lifting the patient's shoulder. So, the patient even though he is prone is brought semi prone I am getting inside the esophagus. Now, we are in the esophagus unlike an end being scope you can see the view is not very great mainly, but with a big wheel away from you. Okay, big wheel towards you will 
take it this way but you want it go other way so you want to take the big way away from you so that way you will be able to see the lumen and as you go along the greater curvature what we call a long route you can see the bile and you can see the antrum and we are nearly going and saying hello to the pylorus you can see the pylorus for there and you see what we call a sunset appearance in other words the pylorus should come more or less at 6 o'clock if you treat my monitor like a clock the clock you will see the pylorus the round the the thing the now we are just entered the pylorus we are going from d1 to d2 the superior duodenal angle there i just make the lock the small wheel just turning it away from me then push the scope further push the scope further beyond the ampulla you can see the bulge ampulla junction of the second and third part and that time i just turn the small big wheel completely towards me so small wheel away so that it turns to the right big wheel towards so it goes upwards so these are the two things then you pull the scope and the scope now hugs the shot the lesser curve and shortened as you can see the ampulla is nicely seen and it is the only longitudinal pole at the top of which you are seeing a small slit like the papilla the major papilla ideally the major papilla if you divide this clock into four quadrant it should be in the left upper quadrant more or less at 10 o'clock position why 10 o'clock position you will be wondering you will soon understand all the equipment or accessories coming in the ERCP scope will say hello to you around 3 o'clock so, so they are going to come from here okay they, so they are going to come that way so you need to be very clear the trajectory how it is going to come I am just going to see this one from this so you will see it is coming from more or less like 3 o'clock so you know the trajectory you can change the angulation by how much you have a control on the and up and down knob of the elevator and also you can ask the staff nurse to control the bow wire okay so there are two ways you can control the thing see for example now she is just bringing her approximating her hand so that there is a little bowing of the wire as you can see the wire is taut so it is more acute like this okay it was like this so it is now so both the elevator and the bowing helps it to go into what we call towards the direction of the common bile duct because I told you common bile duct takes a course from here it goes from the left to this side it goes towards the 10 o'clock whereas pancreatic duct will go the opposite direction towards 2 o'clock position so you have to so now this angulation you just mesmerized by this film this is exactly the location or the direction you want to know so it is going from your when you when you say this side from my right side right to left this side will go pancreatic duct will go this way so you whether you go look at the monitor and just accordingly you do so this is what you have to do as you can see here uh, the surgeon has nicely cannulated but don't be in a hurry because you need to see the fluoroscopy to see whether the cat i mean the cannula or the guide wire is in the right duct and also you should see a tinge of bile as he is aspirating ensuring it may be in the bile duct but still the proof of the pudding is to see whether the see the guide wire is along not across the vertebra and also you can see the contrast has been injected you can see a wide cystic duct and a common hepatic duct and both the right and left hepatic ducts are slightly dilated how to know the sizes you see the reference is your 10.2 or 10.8 size millimeter size of your scope is it smaller than the scope bigger than the scope so this common hepatic duct is slightly smaller so it will be than the scope so it will be around 9.5 to 10 millimeter diameter so like that you can have a reference of your scope because there is some degree of magnification there okay so you can see very easily how i am positioning myself and what is the view you are getting inside I am asking my staff nurse to just pull the wire, tighten it and press the pedal so that yellow pedal and get the endocut. Endocut will cut tuck, 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 tuck like that. It is not like zzz like that. It is not like a zipper cut. Zipper cut will cause uncontrolled cut. We want a controlled cut with a hemostasis. The only way is by endocut, RB, there is a effect endocut. I, we have various uh, uh, things available. So we have here VEM another thing but usually around 30 to 35 watts 
that's what we go and uh, very very important is a control how far can you cut if you ask me here for example you can't go beyond that so if you can see that insert i'll tell you so the, here for example this is the fold you should not go beyond that fold i have about two more millimeter here i can cut if you want but otherwise you can just minimize the cut you can go for what we call a partial sphincterotomy then you go for a sphincteroplasty especially when you are having a fairly large stone like a 10 millimeter or 12 millimeter stone nowadays we don't go for a mechanical lithotripsy now we go for what we call a balloon sphincteroplasty so cre balloon so that is the what we controlled radial expansion balloon so this is a balloon what we normally use depending upon the diameter here so we chose in this patient 10 12 15 sized balloon cre balloon and i am going to pass it through with a guide wire and then the balloon will be three fourth will be inside the duct one fourth will be outside you will be soon see and attached to an alliance gun and then inflate it under pressure and on a given atmospheric pressure i know pretty well this is probably going to be the size so it's all depends upon you don't want to overstretch also it's all device here we know already this patient is having a duct size around 10 to 11 so i'm not going to do it beyond 10 or 11 millimeter so the as you can see the CRE balloon is just in and I am just asking my staffs as you can see watch her hand she is going to just it is like a pistol ha hand so this is inflated with the saline and gradually a controlled radial expansion circumferential expansion stretching it so this is the best way and the people were saying it has theoretically an increased I mean risk of post ERCP pancreatitis but if when you do a sphincterotomy that is going to take all the resistance so it is going to split that way so there is no chance of increasing incidence of pancreatitis in my opinion and you leave it for about a minute so that you know, a degree of hemostasis is also achieved and she is also telling me from the gauge, gauge there what is the atmospheric pressure so i know it is now around 10 millimeter so i asked her to deflate it once it's deflated you can see what happens there is a very adequate opening so this you can't achieve even still you can see a stone drop you just now saw a stone also dropping so that's the beauty of this procedure but even then we normally pass this uh, fogarty balloon and uh, pass at least two or three passes and uh, drag it just to ensure there is no other gravel or sludge and once that done satisfactorily then you can do what we call an occlusion cholangiogram what do you mean by occlusion cholangiogram you just inflate the balloon drag it down see for example here you can see the balloon is just above the common hepatic duct there and i am just pulling it down as you can come all the sludge and everything the balloon inflated balloon came out that means there is no sludge or stone remaining so already stone fell out but still i wanted to be sure so i just kept the balloon at the lower end asked my staff to inject some more contrast and ensure that the contrast fills in nicely there is no filling defect and there is easy contrast extra i mean coming out of the bile duct as soon as i deflate it so all these things ensures there is no residual stone and there is no definite indication for putting a stent so we dispensed without a stent because this patient already had a lap coli so i don't anticipate any problem so this is a glimpse of what we call an occlusion cholangiogram the inflated balloon now i am deflating the balloon then going one more time up then pull it down to ensure for a final time that there is no sludge inside okay so this procedure if it goes well it will go so smoothly and, uh, and this is more or less like an unedited video as you can see this is the final sweep what we call a the balloon sweep so that is very satisfactory then there is no undue bleeding and this patient has given endomethacin suppositories also by, by the time she get out of this table and uh, next day she will be ready for home so this is uh, the response when you have a case going so well obviously uh, the patient's uh, response and also the recovery will be really gratifying for you coming to the tips now you have seen a video now i am going to tell in the next five minutes the 10 tips you learned are going to learn today tip number one 
how to indicate the oropharynx because i'll tell you the difficult area first into the oropharynx because it is a leap of faith for that you ask your assistant who is standing on the opposite side of the table to turn the patient from prone to semi prone hold it there until you go into the pylorus that is the first thing the second thing you do is you keep the small wheel locked so that once the small wheel is locked you have one thing to less to worry about and the third thing is if you have a big wheel away from you so the tip will be like if you see the tip it will be instead of this will be like that so it will be able to see little bit better so these are the three things i'll show you in another video how it is going to be done so these are the three things it will definitely make job easy for you to indicate and because what you are seeing is mostly the side wall as you can see here the side wall is only seen but you go along the long route okay you can see along the greater curvature only you are seeing so how you go big wheel down and talk to the right okay talk to the right clockwise talk once you do that you will see the pylorus how do we know that we re reach the pylorus sunset position this is what we see so sunset position this is the typical position that is 3/4 of the pylorus you are seeing 1/4 is hiding and then you straighten the scope you go blindly that is a leap of faith one more time but don't immediately try to do all the ch wheel change man uh, you have to go into the junction of the d1 and d2 to do what we call the change of the wheel of big wheel and small wheel that is shortening the scope happens at the only in the superior duodenal angle level that is big wheel towards you small wheel away from you your body to turn to one side and you sort and spool the scope and as you do you monitor and you can clearly see what was like this initially along along the greater curvature it becomes along the hugging on the lesser curvature this is the typical hockey stick appearance so this is what you need to do and this is a schematic representation what was like this it will become like this okay so this is all because of this wheel body movement and the sharp fold so this is what you should do and as i said you need to remain in d2 like the case you just now saw about 5 minutes we finish the whole procedure sometime will be for frustrating 40 minutes 50 minutes it might take so till the time how to stay in d2 that is only if you know this four d movements what do you mean by you should know how to control the big wheel small wheel soft and elevator so these are all the four i call four d movements okay coming to the next tip which i already addressed we'll see one more time you try to have your target that is ampulla if you divide the screen into four the top left that is up left upper quadrant like 10 o'clock position because your trajectory is from 3 o'clock towards that so that is what keep the ampulla there and address and understand the ampulla and its parts like for example this also we saw in the last class you refer you ampulla is top of the only vertical fold and it will be nice like a nipple may have an in infundibulum and even it can have a something like a prefuse you try to see some ampulla will be so easy to cannulate some will be hiding in a preampullary diverticulum so it may be challenging so all you need to do is to try to go in face the one advice i give to the beginner is try go beyond the ampulla at the junction of the d2 d3 before you start shortening the scope so that's what you should do see for example here you see the various this is what you should do go a little below the ampulla then you will be able to see the ampulla you have to look at the ampulla like that don't look at okay like this so don't be like this in other words your scope should be at least another 2 cm down otherwise this is what you will end up seeing a bulging so the tip is there you can't go like this so you have to go further down like this this is ideal this is less than ideal and this is an unusual situation where you will be able to see two separate opening very rarely most of the time you have a common channel so n facing ampulla is better don't have a down facing ampulla that means you have to go further down okay then sometimes you are at the n facing but ampulla looks far away from you how to bring it away come near the only way you bring it near is two things one either you can apply suction or the big wheel if you take the big wheel towards you ampulla comes towards you if you take the big wheel away from you ampulla goes recedes away from you very simple so that is a one thing the big wheel come for a rescue to bring the ampulla towards or away 
the last step is always I told you again importance of the three dimensional anatomy of the ampulla that is the sphincter papillae has sphincter cholidocus going towards the 10 o'clock sphincter pancreaticus going towards the 2 o'clock so those you need to understand because you have to direct the bow wire and also the pre cut accordingly so that is why it is important like here for example clock levels or positions are critical like 10 o'clock what happens if you cut at 12 o'clock you might ask usually the bleeding is undue unnecessary in that situation the next is elevator I am sure I need not tell again and again the importance of the elevator is essential like if the elevator is fully down you will be able to up into the bile duct if it is half down then only it will be like pancreatic duct and the last thing I wanted to share with you is again reinforcing what we said last class understand this course of the bile duct is not just simple a gentle curve it is a S shaped like a sigmoid curve of the last two or three centimeter of the bile duct will be very very difficult to traverse sometime it leads all your skill so that's why this little diagram I have given you just to watch it carefully there are three important movements to easily get in one once you go below the end facing that is you see it go a little further below then you pull the scope up scope pull up the scope big wheel towards you so you go near and then elevate it down so it will get in so these are the three important things okay and orient and you try to candulate around 10 o'clock so pull the scope up big wheel towards you so this is the two important thing that will straighten the so called s shaped curve so here is for example it said this is the ampulla i wanted to bring it as you can see it is a little down to my liking slowly if it is little see see and now it is better now it is more or less at the center or in the left upper quadrant then the trajectory is okay now you see the ideal position is left upper quadrant but then watch my trajectory then use the endo cut then keep on watching where your guide wire you can see the guide wire here nicely faintly you will be able to see the guide wire and here we have unedited video so my anesthetist is actually taking the camera moving from my end of view to the c arm that's why sorry for that otherwise you are able to see we have cannulated and we have taken a contrast and you can see the guide wire inside and also the contrast dilated duct you can see here and nicely shortened the things and the, this is the way endo cut should be done like a millimeter at a time and always see okay so you have to now so that is the best way so that there is nothing like a zipper or uncontrolled cut the controlled cut a clean cut cut with the hemostasis so this is only by endo cut with a yellow pattern so this without that i won't recommend an ercp do can be done safely then this is a fairly dilated as you can see it is as dilated as your scope so it is around 10.2 so obviously uh, there is a short stitcher in the lower end so we have to identify whether it is a stricture or a sludge there so we did a balloon sweep to find out so you will soon find out that we are going to do a sphincteroplasty like last time so this is another example of a sphincteroplasty being done after further incremental sphincter sphincterotomy done i am just want to do it as much as possible all the bulging infundibular part can be divided so what you need to do is don't go up to here that is the the first horizontal fold after the bulging amp so don't go up to there you stop somewhere here another one millimeter that's all otherwise there is every chance of micro perforation retroperitoneal perforation that is one of the untoward complication if you are over jealous in your cut okay so this is see keep on bowing and keep on testing and a fully bowed wire should go in and out completely that is what you want to see and how i am taking my time and i am trying to direct it even though it is more towards 11 o'clock i am trying to just orient more towards 10 o'clock every time every chance i am getting and once you have done that i am just taking a another cre balloon just to ensure i have a little bit better dilatation even if there is a little stricture it will stretch three fourth inside one fourth outside and you are able to see completely everything under vision and controlled radial expansion wait for about 30 to 60 seconds 
then deflate, then balloon sweep, like what we do, it becomes like a habit for you. So as we do a CRE balloon again, you can see it has been monitored and you can see the filling defect actually what you see is because of the CRE balloon here. Then wait for some time then deflate and once you have deflated and you take the stone out there are and if possible or if you suspect there could be some malignancy whatever may be the things then you can do what we call a cytology brush you can take or if you have a spy glass that also one can advocate. But at, at your level uh, this principle is mainly to tell you the importance of the sphincterotomy, endocut and the importance or the benefit of the sphincteroplasty, balloon sweep what we have just done and once we have done all the exchange has to be done. See always you have to have a constant communication with your staff nurse that is what I am trying to do here. And so she is trying to do what we call a railroading, how she is going to. So she needs also a lot of teaching and uh, we are just putting the stent uh, as I said the single pigtail stent has been placed now. And once we have done the procedure, last class itself I said equally important is to have a good documentation. So here is an example of how a documentation for our institution will look like with the hospital details stop. But what is important is all the things you have done yourself patient detail, anesthetic detail, all the appropriate pictures, everything you have to write. So the essence, bare essence are he given here. So these are all the things you need to know and post operative advice. If the patient has a stent, you have to tell the patient how long after this procedure she needs a stent removal. So that has to be documented there. Also never forget whatever we do, however careful we are, there is always an element of a problem here because ERCP is not without complication. There is a 5 to 10 percent chance of post ERCP pancreatitis, occasionally bleeding especially if the coagulation is not properly controlled or corrected. Infection is a risk especially when you are trying to fill in an obstructed system or if you are not disinfecting the scope or taking control about the contrast or the fluid you are using you should be very very careful it is like an operation it is a sterile procedure okay and perforation if you are careful not to over inflate your balloons and also you have to be not over jealous with your spintrotomy perforation should not be a problem but still pancreatitis or all this complication can give rise to a well understood well known mortality rate of around 1 percent that is why it is not without danger so do not take it lightly. So try to perfect the art because it is a technically demanding procedure. Every step as I said now I have divided step into 3 or 4 but you can divide into 10 or 15 micro steps learn them try to perfect them. I can tell you one clue and another surgeon or another uh, endoscopist may be able to give you offer you another tip. So try to accumulate all the tips try to get a master of everything because I am sure like Mount Everest the learning curve is going to be steep but the view from there is beautiful. So you plan perform perfect the art of ERCP and I am sure you travel with me for the next three more modules and the next module I am making the whole thing from what you learn from 1 and 2 I put them along with the few more case capsules as ERCP made simple. So till then I will say goodbye thank you very much.